Just said we're going to start off. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start off as a subcommittee while we we'll wait for our illustrious chair. Yeah, we have a guest Ready? here today. Yeah. You know, I like to bang this thing. Good morning. <laughs> we're going to open up the Public Employees Retirement and Social Security Committee. Um, until other members get here, we will open as a subcommittee. And we will begin with uh, our illustrious pro tem uh, with SB 185 de Leon, the public retirement system, public divestiture of thermal coal companies. Mr. De Leon. Thank you. Thank you so begin. very much, um, uh, Mr. Chair. And good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, I'm uh, honored to have an opportunity to present SB 185 uh, to this committee. I know our, our chair uh, is not here as of yet, but nonetheless, uh, you're a wonderful substitute uh, for our chair. So I want to thank the, the illustrious chair of the Black Legislative Caucus of the California State Legislature uh, for opening up uh, this hearing. Uh, to the members, again, uh, good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, SB 185 uh, that is before you today uh, directs the two state pension plans, CalPERS as well as CalSTRS, to divest their thermal coal holdings consistent with their fiduciary responsibilities under state law. SB 185 aligns our investments, uh, our investments policies with our values. Since 2007, the state of California has prohibited our utilities, our IOUs, from investing in new coal power plants in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Coal combustion for energy generation is the leading cause of climate change. According to the United States uh, Energy Information Service, coal plants are the nation's top source of carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions, the primary cause of global warming. A typical coal plant generates more than 3.5 million tons of CO2 carbon dioxide per year. Burning coal is also a leading cause of smog, especially for those who live in the Southern California Basin, uh, Long Beach, uh, San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, again, the Southern California Basin. Acid rain, a toxic air pollution that contributes to respiratory diseases like asthma and emphysema. The number one reason, uh, number one cause for absenteeism in our public school system in the state of California is due to asthma. This is especially acute in the Central Valley, parts of Los Angeles County in the basin, as well as the Inland Empire. And aside from the health and environmental hazards it creates, bottom line is coal is a risky investment that is rapidly losing value. In fact, according to The Economist, which is a right-to-center uh, uh, publication, the market value of America's four largest coal companies have fallen 95% in the last five years. That is from the year 2010. They were valued combined, the four leading American coal companies, at $22 billion. Uh, as of today, the value is $1.2 billion. And the decline is accelerating. The United States will shutter 1.12, I should say 12.8 gigawatts of coal fire power this year, four times as much capacity as we shut down last year. Now, this demand for coal or the lack thereof domestically in the U.S. is not just uh, here in North America. Uh, more specifically, the demand in China, the world's largest coal consumer, is down 8 percent this year, calendar year. Uh, their imports have fallen 38 uh, percent from last year as their economy slows and they take steps to clean up their air. So the bottom line is, colleagues, is the writing is on the wall. Our policies, our technologies, and global markets are still moving in concert away from coal as an energy source. So why continue to invest our public employees' retirement funds into this fading industry, especially given the multitude of health and environmental concerns it creates? Divesting of coal is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the prudent financial decision. According to CalPERS, the portfolios currently contain approximately $167 million in coal investments. This is a fraction of the overall portfolio of both CalPERS as well as Cal, uh, CalSTRS. California is a world leader in the fight against climate change. Certainly, we can find much more sustainable, port, uh, profitable investments for our public pension funds that better suit our values. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Chair, as well as colleagues, SB 185 recognizes what analysis are saying. Coal has become a bad investment. 
and working with CalPERS as well as CalSERS to ensure a smooth uh, divesture process, and neither fund opposes this measure. With that, Mr. Chair, as well as colleagues, I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you, uh, Senator De Leon. And as is our custom, we have, if there are witnesses in support, um, we allow two witnesses, two minutes apiece. So do you, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. My name is Daniel Lashoff. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Next Gen Climate America, the policy advocacy group founded by Tom Steyer. You know, last week, Pope Francis issued a profound and inspirational call to action, uh, urging all people of goodwill to confront climate change. And SB 185 would require California's public pension funds to respond by divesting their portfolios from thermal coal. Uh, as uh, the President Pro Tem said, this is both the right thing to do and the prudent thing to do. Earlier this month, uh, Tom Steyer uh, addressed the Cal Stirs Investment Committee and laid out a framework of five questions to answer when considering divestment. I'd like to just review those briefly with you this morning. First, he asked, uh, does the activity of the company cause substantial harm to society? Uh, with respect to coal, the answer is undeniably yes. Uh, coal combustion, uh, mostly to generate electricity, releases more carbon pollution per unit of energy than any other fuel. And coal-fired power plants are also a source of mercury and other toxic pollutants, as well as particulates, which pose a significant threat to our health and that of our kids. Uh, second, is coal replaceable? Absolutely. Uh, as uh, the President Pro Tem said as well, California's electricity system is already uh, nearly coal-free. Uh, and can easily eliminate the remaining imported coal uh, over the next few years as we continue to increase our reliance on renewables, uh, particularly wind and solar. Third, are coal companies a long-term compounding asset that's appropriate uh, for a large pension fund, such as CalSTRS and CalPERS? Uh, the fact is no. The, the U.S. is moving rapidly away from coal, and uh, as it does so, the value of the stock is, is plummeting. Again, as, uh, as the President Pro Tem said, uh, their value has dropped by astonishing 95 percent since 2010. Fourth question is, uh, is engagement with coal company managers likely to materially address uh, the problem? And again, the answer is no. While it is theoretically possible to capture carbon pollution from coal-fired power plants, um, the cost of doing so is much higher uh, than uh, the cost of simply replacing uh, those power plants with cleaner energy sources. Fifth, um, and the last question I'll address is, uh, is the long-term cost to the beneficiaries uh, from divesting from coal? And the answer is that cost is minimal at worst and uh, quite possibly beneficial. As we said, uh, coal stocks are plummeting. They're already a tiny portion of the portfolio and growing smaller all the time as their value continues to decrease. Uh, in fact, when Tom Steyer went back over the last 35 years, he couldn't find a period when uh, being invested in fossil fuels was a distinct advantage. Uh, but there were certain periods when it was a distinct disadvantage. Now, obviously, past uh, performance does not tell us what the future will hold, but it is worth considering that the energy sector in 1980 was 28 percent of the S&P 500 index. Uh, at the end of 2014, it was just 8 percent. So to conclude, uh, SB 185 would require California's public pension funds to do the right thing, both for the public interest and for their interests of their beneficiary. Uh, I strongly support the bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support? Good morning, Senator De Leon and committee members. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Jody Newman, and I am an investment manager at Trillium Asset Management. Trillium is one of the oldest investment advisors focused exclusively on sustainable and responsible investing. We are Boston based, but we also have San Francisco offices. And I'm here to testify in support of the SB 185. Our employee-owned firm has managed socially and environmentally screened investment funds for individuals and institutions since 1982. And we have seen growing interest in our fossil fuel-free investments, which now represent about 50 percent of our over $2.2 billion in assets under management. 
Trillium also acts as a sub-advisor to the Green Century Balance Fund, and Aaron Gray is here today from Green Century as well. And Green Century has a fossil fuel-free mandate as well. The fund is highly rated on performance by Morningstar, earning a four-star rating. And through April of this year, the fund has outperformed the Lipper Balance Fund average for one, three, five, and ten years. In our experience, fossil fuel free investing has been a credible investment approach. Since 2007, our fossil fuel free core strategy has outperformed the S&P 1500 um, by 40 basis points annually, and that's net of fees. I want to share my perspective as an investment manager who fully understands the demands of building portfolios that seek to minimize risk and maximize return. Some have argued that divestment from coal and all fossil fuels could potentially increase risk and lower return because you're narrowing your investment universe. Recent independent studies have shown that investors can go fossil fuel free without major negative impacts to portfolio performance. Investment firm Apiro Group estimated that excluding fossil fuel companies from 1988 through 2013, a 25-year period, would have an annual standard deviation from its benchmark of just over a quarter of a percent, which has virtually no riskier in terms of volatility. They also report that over a 10-year period, a carbon-free portfolio outperformed its benchmark by 73% over this period of time. MSCI, who is a leading provider of investment decision and port support tools, looked at the impact of excluding companies owning carbon reserves from one of its index funds, the MSCI All World Country Index. It determined that over a five-year period, the active return differential was 1.2% better than the same index without fossil fuel investments. And at Trillium, we utilize a port portfolio optimization software to help us manage the exclusion of fossil fuel stocks from a portfolio. And it helps us find other stocks that closely correlate with these stocks in terms of beta or the volatility of a stock in, ter in terms of the market and the size of the companies we invest in. And investors can also seek to identify substitutes that closely correlate with fossil fuel companies to minimize risk and tracking error which is a variation with the benchmark. Many clean technology and industrial companies provide energy efficient products such as LED lighting, power management, commercial building, and efficiency controls. And I believe that an investment portfolio can provide competitive returns over the market cycle while managing a conscious choice to avoid fossil fuel investment exposure. And I'm pleased to know that this committee is exploring that option. Thank you. Thank you. I want to first uh, express my apologies to Mr. Protam. Thank you for your leadership on so many areas, including in, in, on this bill and for bringing this bill forward. I was um, delayed in, in coming over from a Senate hearing. And thank you to my colleagues for, for getting the, the committee started and, and moving along. I want to, at this point, establish a quorum. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta. Here. Waldron. Here. Cooley. Here. Joan Sawyer. Here. O'Connell. O'Donnell, sorry, <laughs> Rendon, <laughs> Wagner. We have a quorum. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, we were doing uh, two witnesses with substantive comments, and then after that we're asking just name, organization, and position. Good morning. I'm Erin Gray with Green Century Capital Management. I've got over uh, 13 years of experience in the investment field, and I'm here in support of SB 185. Thank you. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Morning, Mr. Chair, members. Justin Malone, on behalf of the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, we believe that we should put our money where our mouths and our lungs are. We urge our vote. Good morning. My name is Christian Molina Cornejo from the Sierra Club, and we support this bill. Christopher Castrillo, on behalf of the California Faculty Association, in support. R. L. Miller, Chair of the California Democratic Party's Environmental Caucus. The California Democratic Party supports this bill. Thank you. Linda Rudolph, Public Health Institute. We support this bill. Coal's bad for our health, bad for the climate, and bad for our investments as a CalPERS pensioner. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Rick Guerrero, SEIU Local 1000, and on behalf of the 95,000 workers that uh, serve the state of California, we ask that you support this bill for the future of our members' investments. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Linda Escalante. I'm here on behalf of NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, in support of this bill. We shouldn't invest in, in coal, which is going to destroy us. Thank you. Chris Brown, 350 Sacramento, and a Cal Sturz family, and we support this bill as a family and as an organization. I'm Carla West from 350.org. We strongly support this bill. Melan Dorden, Dorman, ordinary citizen, in support of the bill. June Sugar, nurse, I support this bill for my asthma patients. Environment California, Dan Jacobson, strong support. Jim Lindbergh on behalf of the Friends Committee on Legislation of California in support. Thank you. Seeing no additional witnesses in support, do we have witnesses in opposition? Please come forward. We're going to ask that we have two witnesses limited to two minutes each with substantive comments. And then if there's any additional witnesses, just name, position uh, on the bill and organization. Good morning, Marty Fisher on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce here in opposition. Uh, we believe that this bill, <clears throat> excuse me, unfairly targets uh, one type of business from which should have asked, and it leaves us wondering which industry or businesses will be next. Uh, coal is out of favor right now, and we're concerned that our members could be targeted in the next round of divestiture. We think that decisions, investment decisions, should be made based um, solely on sound economic principles. The um, committee analysis has identified that there will be significant costs with this, with this divestment. So we urge you to give funding of retirement obligations the highest priority to protect those who depend on it for their retirement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Don Kepke on behalf of the California Manufacturers and Technology Association, also in opposition for the reasons stated. Thank you. Thank you. Additional witnesses in opposition? Seeing none. Any comments or questions from committee members? Seeing none, we can entertain a motion. We have a motion and we have a second. Mr. Potem, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm hoping that with the, the, the support of the California Democratic Party that we may move uh, Ms. Waldron in support of the measure. I don't know if that will carry any weight uh, with Ms. Waldron, but... Uh, <laughs> Try my best, you know, in every which way. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, as well as to the members for giving me an opportunity uh, to present this bill. The, the last point I just want to really underscore um, is that um, CalPERS and CalSTRS, uh, the board members, the CEO, as well as the CIO, have a, a fiduciary responsibility to their pensioners, uh, whether they're teachers, uh, whether they're uh, uh, folks who work, you know, very hard uh, to make a living. And... Um, uh, as 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 I I wrapped my my brain around this measure, which is, is uh, the, the critical issue of of thermal coal and what the negative impacts are with regards to climate uh, globally, um, we also have to have in mind also what are the potential uh, ramifications, unintended consequences with regards to our pensioners first and foremost. And I think that we feel very confidently with our uh, uh, conversations as well as negotiations uh, with the governance uh, uh, structure of both uh, pensions, both CalPERS and CalSTRS, that it will not have any negative impact at all whatsoever uh, on our pensioners, given the fact that the portfolio um, is limited to begin with, and plus the value in itself uh, is has dropped uh, so dramatically. Uh, it's 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 the right thing to do for public health, but just as importantly, uh, because it is the right fiduciary financial decision, um, and look for other uh, ventures that obviously bring a much higher return to the pensioners. With that, again, I want to thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to present this measure, and I respectfully ask uh, for an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Potem, for your strong leadership on this issue. I'm proud to support your bill today. Um, the, we have a motion. We have a second. The motion is due pass to appropriations. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta. Aye. Bonta. Aye. Waldron. No. Waldron. No. Cooley. Joan Sawyer. Aye. Joan Sawyer. Aye. O'Donnell. Aye. 
O'Donnell, aye. Rendon, Wagner. The bill has three votes uh, and will remain on call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Pro Tem. We operate in sign-in order. Um, some of the authors that are signed in before Assemblymember Gallagher are not present, so we're going to call in Assemblymember Gallagher. We have item number one, ACA 3. Proceed whenever you're ready, Assemblymember Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, proud to present to you today ACA 3. And I brought this measure forward um, because I think we've all now come to agree and, and learn that retroactive pension increases uh, are bad public policy. Um, you know, with the passage of SB 400 in 1999. Uh, that that led to an increase in pension formulas across the state and localities, uh, counties, cities. Uh, but what also came with that was the ability to do retroactive increases, uh, which increased uh, pension liabilities in the millions um, across the state in different localities uh, throughout the state. And I, I know because from my own county, uh, Sutter County, where I was a supervisor, uh, prior to me coming on the board, they had done a retroactive benefit increase uh, uh, and what that led to is actually uh, in, in 2000, we were, our annual pension cost was zero dollars, which probably should have never been the case because we shouldn't have allowed those holidays. Uh, but that was zero dollars, and it went to, uh, by the time I was coming on the board in 09, 15 million dollar annual pension cost. That's money that's not going to roads, that's money that's not going to basic services that we needed um, in, our, in our local county. And a big part of that was the retroactive, because they did a retroactive benefit increase, increase, millions of dollars in liability that was added on because we decided to make that retroactive. And, you know, that's bad policy because, one, during those years there was no expectation uh, that you would be getting a higher benefit. You didn't have that expectation until the pension actually changed, and at that point going forward, you would have an expectation. Um, and in 2014, a study by California Common Cause, a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank, dedicated to developing data-driven analysis, who's also a supporter of this bill, found that these increases added billions of dollars in additional cost to taxpayers' burden, even though at the time of the increases, CalPERS promised that they would not cost taxpayers a dime. The problem with that was CalPERS assumed an 8% 8, 8 rate of return, which only had a 50% chance of happening, and as we know, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, it also had an impact on CalSTRS. Uh, legislation that was also passed in 2000 retroactively increased benefits for CalSTRS members, which added $55 billion uh, to the existing debt. Uh, so I think I think the point is here is we, we have come to agree and find, and the data shows that these retroactive pension increases are bad public policy and we enacted that into PEPRA uh, prohibiting these and my all all my measure does is say hey let's make this part of the Constitution so this never happens again and some might say well hey we already have it in statute well in 2000 we changed the statute to allow retroactive pension increases and we got that's how we got into the mess to begin with uh, so my proposal is that we put this in the Constitution. It allows greater protection. And, and what I would say to people that want to oppose my bill um, is explain to me why retroactive ben pension increases should still be an option, why they should still be on the table uh, as an alternative that we could take advantage of, because that's the only reason why you would want to leave this sort of hanging out there. Uh, so I think people have to say, you know, not only why they don't think this should be in the Constitution, but why do you, th you know, why do you think that retroactive pension increases uh, could still be good policy? I don't, I don't see any argument uh, for allowing this option to stay around. It's, it's cost taxpayers billions of dollars. It's left 
our cities and counties without much needed resources that they could use um, for roads, for health and human services, for all the things that our constituents rely on day to day. Um, and we should just, we should get rid of this practice. And I think this constitutional amendment helps to do that. So uh, I thank you for allowing me to bring this forward. Uh, thank you for your consideration. I would ask for your aye vote. I do have one witness uh, with me today. Thank you, Assemblymember Gallagher. Witnesses in support. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members, good morning. David Wolf with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. We're in support of ACA 3. And members, let's understand what this bill does. This is a very narrowly tailored bill in scope that doesn't remove any pension benefits at all for any current employees. Um, very narrowly tailored bill. We're not talking about gutting pension benefits. We're just talking about ensuring that retroactive benefits that you know, we believe never should have been law in the first place and have spiked unfunded liabilities to dramatic levels um, are not in play anymore. And the only way to get there is to ensure that this provision is placed in the Constitution. Because let's understand, members, what SB 400 did, and the author uh, referenced it in his testimony. And I'll just mention one other statistic. If we hadn't passed SB 400, CalSTRS, the teacher retirement fund system, would be 89% funded today had the law not been in place. And right now it's under 80%, if I understand the numbers correctly. Merely pre-funding our $60 billion unfunded health care liability on a going forward basis will cost billions of general fund dollars every year, and that doesn't even count the overall $500 billion unfunded liability, um, depending on how conservative you expect the rate of return to be, that we're going to have to pay off as a state over the next 30 years. Now, Governor Brown in 2013, as was mentioned, you know, did... Um, adopt PEPRA into law, and we were nominally happy with this pension reform that was advanced two years ago because it did end some of these retroactive pension benefits, the ability to buy airtime, the ability to spike one's pension. But we've seen on a going forward basis that this statutory reform was simply not sufficient. As an example, uh, CalPERS recently authorized 100 various pay enhancement pension benefits over the governor's objections. And this simply underscores the fact that this statutory re reform was not sufficient because we can continue to pass various enhancements that drive up our pension costs. And if you can do it for these en pension enhancements, why can't you go back and change it so these pension benefits can then be also adopted retroactively? Statutory reform is not sufficient to ensure that we have adequate pension reform and to ensure, as Mr. Gallagher mentioned, that we have enough general fund dollars to provide necessary ongoing payments to the various social service and education programs and law enforcement programs that keep us functioning as a state. So for all those reasons, we think this is absolutely necessary, should have been passed years ago, and ask for an I vote. Additional witnesses in support? Seeing none, witnesses in opposition. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Christy Bauma representing the California Professional Firefighters. Uh, we are opposed to ACA3. Um, appreciate the author's interest in uh, protecting our local communities, although I would argue that firefighters have a vested interest in doing the same. Um, I think that just on its face, California's constitution is established to grant powers and rights and there is a certain train of thought in this state that likes to use our constitution in a punitive manner to restrict and limit limit and eliminate uh, rights across the board so uh, first and foremost placing anything like this in the constitution i would argue is bad policy um, uh, secondarily in its drafting it is clunky at best and will trigger um, all sorts of problems at the local government level uh, dealing with retirement, even compensation levels as drafted, it would impact, you know, I get a promotion, I was a fire captain, now I'm a fire chief. By virtue of that, it might change my classification to safety, from safety to miscellaneous. Uh, does, does that trigger the same sort of limitation? I think that this handicaps 
uh, local electeds to make the right decisions for their communities. Um, and I maybe just, I'm all alone here at the table, um, so I don't feel like I can cover all of the bases, but I would say that there have been some sweeping statements about what is or is not impacting a community's ability to provide uh, services to their constituents. Um, and it is, it, while it is a talking point and a narrative, it is not substantiated by the data. My own firefighters in Stockton who went through a brutal, brutal uh, time in their community and even had to suffer under their, their city going through bankruptcy proceedings, acknowledged by the judge and others was the poor decisions made at the local government level on development issues and things well beyond providing for employees. And the judge even acknowledged these employees, before that city ever got near a bankruptcy proceeding, had concessions, bargained concessions at the table year after year after year after year. And then, which is why in bankruptcy, the judge said, enough. These employees have suffered enough. So we think this is a punitive measure, uh, and we urge you to reject it. Mr. and Chairman and members, Dolores Duran Flores with the California School Employees Association. We're, I'm sorry, I was running from committee to committee, so I missed much of the debate, but we strongly oppose this bill as well. Um, Christy articulated a lot of the concerns we have, as well as we just think it, it violates collective bargaining. You know, it circumvents collective bargaining process, and that's the biggest concern we have, as well as we've done, we've already done pension reform with PEPRA. Um, we all participated in that process. And um, again, we strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Additional witnesses in opposition? Seeing none, any comments or questions from members? Seeing none. We can entertain a motion. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. The motion is the uh, ACA 3 be adopted to Appropriations Committee. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh, I'm Chairman, sorry. Um, Mr. Assemblymember Gallagher, uh, would you like to close? Th thank you. I just I wanted to clarify a couple things because I think there's, there is some misinformation out there. Um, and I think this is really important. First of all, this doesn't do anything about classifications. So I don't even know how that became an issue. It doesn't do anything about changing classifications. The only thing this does is put in the Constitution that you can't do a retroactive uh, pension benefit increase. That's it. That, that's the only thing that it prohibits. It would not cause any problems for classification changes. It does not prohibit people for bargaining for greater pension increases in the future. It just says that those can't be retroactive. Um, so, and I'm, and it, it does not inf impact collective bargaining either. Um, as I said, I was a, I was a Sutter County supervisor, and we went back to the bargaining table with our, with our employee unions. I respect the collective bargaining process, and we sat down on the table and we worked out a, a resolution going forward, created a new tier um, to address our, our pension. We did that by negotiating with our employees to do that. Um, so nothing in this impacts collective bargaining. That would still be the case. All local governments are going to negotiate with their local unions to discuss what pension benefits uh, they, they want to have or what changes they want to make. But those, those changes would be prospective, which is how it should be. Um, this is about going forward. You can't change what the past is. Um, and when you do so, you, make, you could make drastic uh, yeah, let's talk about the other way. You could make retroactive changes that would have a drastic uh, negative effect on employee groups. Um, that wouldn't be good either. Um, but also doing it in a way that, that drastically increases the pension liability is not good for the taxpayers, and everybody agrees on that. And as I said, nobody got up here and made the case for retroactive benefit increases, not one person, and nobody will because it's been proven time and time again that this is bad policy. And, it, and, and certainly there, across the board, there's different issues that come up. I don't know how Stockton got brought into this. Uh, that's, that wasn't the issue in Stockton. That was a, that was a bankruptcy case, federal bankruptcy case. Um, you know, all I'm talking about is the process of doing retroactive benefit increases, and we should take that off the table as, as bad public policy. Um, so I'd really encourage you to just look at what this bill does 
and not what people are saying it does, but look at what it actually does. And I would just I think this is something that we can get on board by in a bipartisan way that we're going to move forward. And we're not going to you know allow this process, allow this tool to remain on the table that has cost taxpayers billions of dollars. And one other thing I want to bring about public safety is very important to me because because of that fifteen million dollars a year that out of my budget I was having to put into uh, the pension program because of retroactive pension increases, we had to consider not filling another deputy sheriff position, not filling public safety, vital public safety positions at the local level that I needed, that my, that my you know, constituents relied upon. That's the real impact of public safety, is that there's less dollars available to help get people out there on, uh, on the streets and help keep people safe, and to help get more firefighters out there protecting people, to make sure that there's, you know, those, those requirements are met. So, uh, again, let's focus on what this legislation is, and I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Gallagher. We have a motion. We have a second. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta. No. Bonta. No. Waldron. Aye. Waldron. Aye. Cooley. Joan Sawyer. O'Donnell. Rendon. No. Rendon. No. Wagner. Aye. Wagner. Aye. You have two votes. The bill's on call. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblymember Gallagher. I see Senator Bell. I'm sorry. Senator Pan. There, there you are. Um, Senator Pan is signed in first. I apologize. I didn't see you out there, Senator Pan. 